Hi, my name is Paul Francis and I'm an astronomer here at the Australian National University. And this is one of a series of videos about some of the great unsolved mysteries of the universe, things that have us astrophysicists pretty much baffled. This one I want to talk about the mystery of a particular sort of giant black holes known as quasars. I'll explain what a quasar is in a minute, but it's thought to be a giant black hole, perhaps weighing a billion times as much as the sun, sucking the heart out of the galaxy. And the real problem is here is how do these giant black holes get to be so big? One thinks of black holes as what does it eat everything, suck it in. In fact, the problem is they don't suck enough. So this might be the mystery of why, how black holes suck. Now this is a mystery that started in the 1960s with the discovery of some rather strange dots of light. If you take a photograph of pots in the sky, you see lots of dots of light, and by and large most of the stars in our own galaxy, pretty boring, 100 billion of them, no, make it 100 billion plus one, who cares? Every now and then a galaxy, it's even more boring because there's a thousand billion known galaxies, a thousand billion plus one, yawn. But every now and then people saw dots, like that one over there, you need the arrow to work out why that's an interesting dot, which were a bit strange. It looked like a star, they were called quasi-stellar objects because they looked like stars, but they weren't, they're not stars. They're actually a billion, billion times further away than a star. Um, not quite a billion, billion, but it's about a billion times. I shouldn't get it run away with the numbers. A billion times further away than a normal star. These dots, they look like normal stars, but because they're a billion times further away and they still look the same brightness, that means they're a billion squared, billion, billion times brighter. So that innocent looking dot, this one here is actually about 12 billion light years away. And it's got so much, puts, puts out so much power that if we took away the sun and replaced it with one of these dots, it would actually vaporize the Earth in less than a millisecond. That's how wide it has to be for us to see it at such an enormous distance. So this is what happened in the 60s. People, the dots, the dots that roar. What, what was happening with these dots? It's very small things that were incredibly luminous. So to begin with, people thought that maybe they were like an exploding galaxy. But there's a problem with that. Here's a galaxy. Let's say a galaxy decided to explode. Galaxies are quite big. The distance from here to here is like 60,000 light years. But let's imagine by some amazing coincidence the entire galaxy decided to go bang at some moment. The left hand side, the right hand side, the middle, all went bang. We, would still, we wouldn't see a sudden brightening because let's say, let's say the Earth's over here, we're looking. When this explodes, the light will reach us 60,000 years before the light from the far side. So something 60,000 light years across and suddenly doubled in brightness, we would see a very gentle increase in brightness over 60,000 years, which is beyond the time scale of most people's PhD theses, so we wouldn't see it at all. However, these quasars, these dots, could double in brightness in as little as a few seconds, definitely minutes or half an hour or so. That meant that whatever they were, they had to be really small, much smaller than just one pixel here. So we need something that's brighter, these things, a dot that puts out a power, billion, billion times the power of the sun, and yet it's so small that light you know, from one side to the other in only a few seconds or minutes. So what, what's going on here? This is just incredible. The normal idea is that these things lurk in the middle of galaxies. So here's a galaxy, and it's got a dot in the middle of it. And this dot is so bright that normally it drowns out the light from the background galaxy. As you'll see here in a second, they'll light up the quasar in the middle of the thing, and you'll see that the light from the galaxy is drowned out. And this is actually known to be the case. When you look really hard with the best telescopes in the world, you can see that these apparent dots are surrounded by galaxies. So it appears that we have something incredibly bright living in the middle of a galaxy and very, very small. And that's been a great problem. What, what could put out that much power and be that small. Stars can't do it. It turns out that even the most luminous stars are nothing light powerful enough to do this. And even if you invented some new star that was much more massive, it would probably collapse and it couldn't keep up the power for very long. You could cause some sort of explosion, like a supernova. The supernova put out this power, they put out the same sort of power, but only for a few seconds, whereas these quasars have been going since the 60s at least, and probably for millions of years. So we need something that has incredible power, really small space, that's capable of putting out that power for a very long time. Nuclear fusion can't do it. Nuclear fusion is a pretty powerful energy source, but whenever you have nuclear fusion, you produce leftover elements. These clouds of elements will form a cloud around and block out the light. So that can't work. Chemical power can't do it. There's no chemical explosives in the world, anything in the universe, anything like enough to do this. The only power source we could think of that could do this, which is an incredible amount of power, is gravity and lots of gravity. In particular, a black hole. Now, 
you don't normally think of gravity as producing power. But let's say we had a black hole over the far side of the screen there, and I had in my hand a peanut. Now if I let go of the peanut, what's it going to do? It's going to get sucked in towards the black hole over here. By the time it gets very close to the black hole, it will be travelling very, very close to the speed of light. So let's say I'm over here and I let go of a peanut and it flies in and someone is foolish enough to put their hand in front of it. Actually, you wouldn't be able to keep put your hand because your hand gets sucked into the black hole. But if you put your hand here and the peanut came through, as the peanut hit your hand, it would produce a peanut-shaped hole in your hand, but it would also produce an explosion about equivalent to a 100 kiloton atom bomb. Um, that would be enough to destroy the entire city. So the motto is, if you're near a black hole, keep your peanuts in your pocket. But the real motto is, there's a lot of energy. Because things are moving so close when they get close to black hole, if a peanut bumped into another peanut, or anything else like that, there'd be enormous amounts of energy liberated. You can actually turn about 10% of the mass into energy, whereas the best nuclear fusion only generates about 1%. So this is the idea. Also, if you have a really big black hole in the middle, a really heavy one, that's, that allows you to keep all the energy together. If you had the energy generated and there wasn't a big mass, it just blows itself to pieces. So the black hole serves a dual purpose. It's gives you energy by allowing you to suck things in and you have to bump things into each other close to the black hole and also it keeps all that energy close together. So that was the idea. So here's a simulation of what something like this might look like. The idea might be that the gas, not peanuts, gas in this case, has fallen close to a black hole and is actually swirling around in what's called an accretion disk. So you get the spinning disk of gas around it and this disk is spinning so fast and rubbing against other parts of the disk that it gets in the centre white hot, it gets up to a temperature of almost 30,000 degrees, so even higher. And this, because it's so hot, it's generating intense radiation, and that's what we see. Also, this is one of the unsolved mysteries, in about 10% of all these quasars, you see jets coming out. For some reason, you've got the spinning disk, and it squirts out at right angles a jet. And this is actually going to morph into a real image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope um, of one of these jets. You've got the quasar down here, the dot that roars and the squirting out stuff like a hose pipe at, um, at the best part of the speed of light. And we've no idea why that happens, but that's not a mystery for another day. The mystery I want to talk about today is going back to the dot here in the middle. So what we've got is a really big black hole. You can work out how big the black hole has to be, it's about a billion times the mass of the sun, which is a lot. And you've got to feed gas into it, and the gas has to swirl around and fall down the throat and get very, very hot. Okay, so what's the problem there? Well, the problem is it's not as easy as all that to feed a black hole. Let me show you a little simulation here. So here's a black hole. Let's see. And over there was an object which has fallen into it. So imagine that one object was a spacecraft and it does what you'd expect to get sucked into the black hole. Let's say you were in that spacecraft and you didn't want to get sucked into the black hole. What might you do? Well, you might think you'd point that way and fire a rocket as hard as you can. So let's do that. Let's change the simulation and give the rocket a speed of 30,000 meters per second directly away from the black hole to begin with. Okay, so now it's going away from the black hole. Oh no, it's coming back. So that didn't actually do the trick. Sure enough, it started you off going away from the black hole, but soon the gravity sucked you in. So, so far, it's kind of imagined what everyone thinks about black holes, that they suck. However, let's say you were a clever astronaut, and instead of trying to run directly away from the black hole, you decided to run at right angles. So you try and go sideways. Now it's going to sideways speed. And now what happens? So they're the same speed as before, and now it's sideways. And what you can see is it's actually missed the black hole. It's swooped around it and gone into an orbit. And this orbit is perfectly stable. It will keep on doing this forever. It's never going to spiral in. Let's hit something else on the peanut, for example. I'll be careful about the peanuts around here. The motto of this is that it's actually quite easy to avoid being sucked in by a black hole. It's, it's like a rip current on an Australian beach. You don't try and swim against it. That's a swim you will lose. You swim across it and get out of it. Likewise, the gravity of the black hole is like a rip. It's trying to suck you in. But if you go sideways, gravity will work for you rather than against you. You whip around the black hole and be perfectly safe. And herein lies the problem. 
black holes live in galaxies. All the gas to build the black hole in the first place and to feed it, and you need it to be fed, otherwise it's not going to shine, is coming from the galaxy. But the black hole has a radius of about the radius of the solar system, whereas galaxies are about a million times bigger. And all the gas and stars in the galaxy, like this one, are very happily orbiting around where they are. They've got just enough rotation to stay where they are. The black holes are going to change that. Somehow you need to stop their motion and make them fall into the middle. And that's very hard. If you've got something spinning and you make it smaller, it spins faster. There's classic experiments you may have seen where people try to spin around on office chairs. I'm sure you never do that. I'm sure I never do. <clears throat> um, if you spin around an office chair with your arms and legs out and then bring them close together, you'll spin faster and faster. Same thing happens in the gas in the galaxy. It's out here, a long way from the centre. And if for some reason it tries to get sucked in, it will spin faster and faster. The centrifugal force will get bigger and bigger and it won't fall in. And bear in mind that the black hole of the scale is far less than a pixel over here. We're trying to get gas of the thing to, uh, to a million times smaller. It's trying to, like, to convert me into something rather smaller than a grain of sand. It's a huge shrinkage. And it's very, very hard because gas is just spinning too much. This is problem number one. How do you get the gas to build the black hole? You need to put a billion solar masses right to absolutely tiny, tiny place in the middle. It's much smaller than the bullseye of the dartboard. But the gas is still perfectly happy spinning around much further out. How can you get rid of all that spin to one part in a million to get it to fall into the centre? And the answer is... We don't know. We haven't idea. For a while, people thought maybe two galaxies would collide that would muck up the gas, but it turns out that doesn't really work. Um, we're kind of stuck on this one. Uh, maybe some strange dynamics in the galaxy. We don't know. So that's problem number one. How do you actually feed the beast? How do you make it so big in the middle? There's a second problem, which is going back to this disk. How does the disk get to be so hot, and how does it feed the black hole in the middle? The theory of this goes back to two Russian physicists from the 60s, Shakura and Semyayev. And the theory is that... Let me go back. The theory is that the inner parts of the disk are going really, really fast around. They have to be because the gravity is very intense in there. And the outer parts are going really, really slowly around. That means you've got the fast bits rubbing against the slow bits. You get viscosity, so fluid friction. The fluid friction is what makes it get hot. And also it means that the inner bits will be slowed down and the outer bits will be sped up. So the inner bits will be slowed down and that will move, and allow them to move inwards. And the outer bits will be sped up which will fling them outwards. So that can feed the beast in the middle and cause it to spread further out. All very nice. One little problem. This cost is about a thousand times too weak to do this. Ah. Ah. Oh well. Um, so we need something else going on. Um, something is allowing the thing to get very hot and feed the gas, and we don't know what it is. Usually in astronomy, when we've got no idea what's going on, we say, ah, magnetic fields, turbulence, wave our hands, put on a goofy expression, hope you go away and ignore us. The reason is that turbulence and magnetic fields are so hard to calculate. I mean, look at turbulence. If you take a tap in your bathroom and turn it on really full, your water spraying out in a really complicated pattern. That's beyond the world's fastest supercomputer's ability to simulate, because it's constantly changing, drops going everywhere. Probably these creation disks are as turbulent like the weather on the Earth. They've probably got cyclones and storms and things like that. And no more than we can forecast the weather on Earth, but can we forecast what's going on in these things? Magnetic fields are also a problem because magnetic fields will tie different parts of this together and cause really complicated motions. So, ha! Ah, it's magnetic fields, it's turbulence, please go away. So this is the problem. We know there are giant black holes in the middle of most galaxies. We know they suck in huge amounts of stuff. Where did they get the mass to form in the first place? And where did they get all the stuff they're eating? They've got to shrink the stuff down an enormous factor to get it in there, and galaxies are just spinning too fast for it to work. We don't know the answer to that. Thanks for watching.